Hello, everybody. Hola. Bonjour. I'm Dr. Susan Nicole, Chair of the WFSA Workforce Wellbeing Committee. I'd like to welcome everyone to this third webinar in the WFSA Year of Wellbeing. And thank you to our three speakers, Professor Neskovich, Dr. A. Zivedo, and Professor Jacobs, and also to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend. The purpose of this webinar was twofold. Firstly, to present on topics of well-being relevant to the anaesthesia workforce globally. And secondly, to collaborate with other WFSA committees where their work is well relevant to well-being. I'm very happy to be working tonight with the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee who will present on well-being and the ageing anaesthesiologist anaesthetist workforce. We are thrilled to have over 2,000 registrations for this webinar, which is a WFSA record. As outlined earlier, if you are looking for translation, French or Spanish, then you need to be in the correct audio channel, and there are instructions about this in the chat. I'll now hand over to my co-chair, Professor Fazia Khan, who is chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee to introduce the webinar. Thank you very much, Susan, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Greetings from the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee of WFSA, which I currently chair. I will just take a few minutes to introduce the DEI committee uh, to you. Compared to other WFSA com committees, this is a fairly young committee. We started as a gender balance group but then quickly realized that DEI was much more than that. The diversity, equity, and inclusion is recognized by, by, by the United Nations as a fundamental human right, and it relates to the practice or to provide support to people from various backgrounds and provide them chances and resources so that they can perform the best to their abilities. Our committee's main aim is to create global awareness and importance of DEI and anesthesiology and to promote DEI in our profession. At present, we have 15 members from different countries. For this webinar, we chose the aging anesthesiologist as there is plenty of evidence that shows that the current anesthesia workforce is aging and it faces several issues and there is a need to address these issues. As Susan has said, we've had immense interest in the topic. I will now hand over to Dr. Hazel Mampansha, who is a member of the DEI committee of WFSA and she will introduce the speakers before each presentation. Hazel. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you again for joining us. It is my um, singular privilege to welcome our first presenter. Our first presenter is um, Professor Vodislava Neskovic. Professor Neskovic is a staff at the, uh, is a staff anesthetist and Associate Professor in Anesthesia and Intensive Care in the Medical Faculty at the Military Medical Academy in Belgrade, Serbia. Professor Neskovic's work is centered around cardiothoracic and vascular anesthesia and intensive care, and she is also focused on medical training and education for both undergraduate and postgraduate learners. Professor Neskovic was also uh, the past chair for the European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Gender Equity Committee and the past president for the Serbian Association of Anesthetists and Intensivists. Professor Neskovic, thank you very much for speaking with us today and we look forward to hearing your talk, which is about what questions need to be answered to develop a strategy for the aging anesthesiologist. Over to you, Professor Neskovic. Hello from Belgrade and um... Uh, it is both my 
honor and pleasure to um, participate in this global event uh, on the, this first topic. And uh, the objectives that uh, uh, we will touch today will be to discuss why is this topic interesting and what are the questions actually that should be addressed. And also to define what is aging anesthesiologist and to assess current knowledge and uh, proposed practices uh, for aging anesthesiologists in terms of uh, uh, strategy and uh, uh, assessment of uh, the uh, competence and also to think further and to probably try to define starting points for the future. And uh, we all know that people are living longer and uh, the world is experiencing growth in both size and proportion of older population. So in 2020, uh, people older than over 60 uh, outnumbered children younger than five. And also by 2030, one in six people in the world will be over 60. And by 2050, population of people age 60 plus will double. So uh, also, uh, it's not just about uh, aging, and uh, we also have to think uh, that uh, uh, there is no single and strict way how we age, and uh, there is no model of age person. So uh, in those terms, uh, this is a population that is very diverse. And uh, although uh, ageism in terms of uh, stereotypes, prejudice, and uh, discrimination uh, may affect all age groups, usually ageism is related to older, uh, how we treat older people. And uh, they are often seen as, uh, as burden. And of course, age uh, often intersects with other uh, forms of uh, disadvantage. So older people really uh, may be uh, in different ways uh, um, uh, discriminating, not only by age, but also gender, uh, social, economical issues, health and uh, uh, cultural background. And uh, also anesthesiologists age like everybody else. Uh, so in uh, anesthesia, uh, this problem is important for two reasons. First of all, in uh, terms of workforce, not only by uh, the number of anesth practicing anesthesiologists, and the need for uh, anesthesiologists worldwide, uh, but also with the change of demographics of anesthesiologists and uh, having more and more uh, uh, older anesthesiologists still practicing. And that also rise on the other hand, the question of patient safety or whether uh, older anesthesiologists are uh, fit or uh, let's say competent of uh, providing uh, high standards of care. And I'm sure that this, uh, uh, picture many of you uh, recognize because this is uh, the results of uh, uh, the most comprehensive study uh, performed by WFSA uh, a few years ago on uh, workforce and uh, data were collected from 153 countries and what we may see is that uh, almost half have a serious shortage of anesthesiologists actually less than five per uh, 100,000 uh, of population. So global shortage, bo 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 let's say of anesthesia workforce has been acknowledged. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that everybody is uh, aware of that, although I'm not sure that uh, uh, our right interventions are still in place. But it's not just the numbers, it's actually the structure itself that also changes. So here you can see example from France, where you see that in 16 years, a percentage of people that are older than 50 years and still practicing anesthesia have been uh, over 50%. And uh, uh, we may just also think that nowadays, majority of these people from 2005 are already retired or actually are planning retirement. And at the same time uh, that we have older people practicing anesthesia and uh, talking about workforce, uh, demand for anesthesia is growing and anesthesiologist is growing. And also there are more procedures and also procedures out of the operating rooms, meaning that our job also 
architecture and structure is uh, changing. And uh, there is an increased need for uh, anesthesiologists, although we are already in shortage. And uh, fewer people want to uh, actually uh, choose med medicine globally and uh, and as uh, generally as a profession, and also anesthesia as well. So we have inadequate recruitment of uh, doctors for anesthesia and intensive care. So some of the solutions, like postponing the date of retirement, are present in some countries in France, let's say. But uh, we have to see if uh, what would be the future directions for that. And although um, we may feel old or young, uh, uh, that's pretty much individually, but as a definition, actually older anesthesiologists are those uh, that are actually older than 55, or let's say that the population that is planning, considering re retirement. And we may see here that uh, although there are not much data from the structure of workforce and practicing anesthes older anesthesiologists within the countries, we can see here that, for example, in US and Canada, a percentage of anesthetists older than 55 to 64 is higher than anesthetists from 35 to 44. And also there are still a um, um, significant percentage of people older than 65 still practicing in US and Canada. Although in UK, the number of people older than 65 are actually uh, very low. And that is uh, uh, in hand uh, with uh, postponing almost a million of surgeries uh, per year in uh, UK due to lack of anesthesiologists. And because of that, they have some uh, reasons why people who should stay and practice with the uh, older age uh, has been explored. And also people, well, uh, some interventions or let's say motivations or uh, some practices, protocols to be implemented uh, have been explored as well. So we can see that it overlaps the reasons why people leave and why people stay on work actually overlaps. They are more or less the same. So uh, people usually retire because it's unsustainable uh, work uh, load and uh, there are some financial concerns and uh, burnout and that uh, work-life balance uh, is uh, endangered. Uh, but or compromised, uh, but uh, as well, we can see that the majority of people, if they decide to stay, like to think about their work-life balance, and also uh, they would expect that some adjustments of clinical practice uh, environment uh, should be in place due to physical changes of doctors with age. But at the same time, as we obviously will rely on older anesthesiologists to stay and work in order to support the system and uh, to contribute to uh, the job done, we see here uh, results of uh, uh, one of the papers that can be uh, uh, very known and very often uh, uh, cited. And that's the association between anesthesiologist age and litigation. And here we can see that uh, the number of litigation obviously is the highest with the younger gener generation, doctors with uh, that are younger than 51. But if we put that in the perspective of number of procedures that are performed, we can see that the per uh, claim ratio, legal claim ratio, is the highest for the anesthesiologists that are uh, older than 65. And uh, so older anesthesiologists over 65 of age actually have 1.5 uh, times risk of being uh, found responsible at the court and the reasons should be explored. So probably it's not just uh, aging, it's uh, it's not just age itself. Probably we are comparing different population uh, of anesthetists anesthet anesthet with different background in education and also probably people working alone in remote uh, uh, hospitals. So it's not so uh, probably black and white. But uh, if we compare now uh, cognitive um, function in in uh, in physicians or uh, overall in physicians we can see here as well that uh, uh, cognitive uh, um, function is de uh, declining which is not such a surprising and particularly at the age over 60 but what we here see here is that also variability uh, index is actually increasing from 50 uh, years of age and older meaning that we are very different and although 
although some people may be affected with the uh, lack of fitness or maybe cognitive decline, but some others may not. And because of that, we are thinking about uh, performance or competence of uh, older anesthetists. Uh, so uh, difference between performance and competence in a way is a difference between outcome and a process itself. So in terms of uh, those terms, outcome may be okay, but the process itself may be compromised and may have flaws. And uh, we often talk about competence within anesthesia as uh, technical and non-technical skills. And we, because of that, we are talking about a meta competence, something which is beyond uh, just uh, something that we can measure. And because of that, the people often think that older anesthesiologists are probably safer, which does not also have to be like that, because within the competence, we have dynamic impairment, which very much depends on physical and cognitive deterioration, as well as non-technical skills, both cognitive decision making or interpersonal like communication. And it's it's also context dependent, meaning some people older may be very experienced in some areas of anesthesia and with a lack of experience or a lack of number of cases in some other areas. And the other thing, which is also very important for all age group is actually fatigue, which affects even younger anesthesiologists. But for older anesthesiologists, that's a number one problem because we have a sleep deprivation and also longer time is needed for anesthetists to older anesthetists to recover. And because of that, there are some ideas that somehow, obviously, we cannot treat uh, aging anesthesiologists as a group, but probably as individuals. And because of that, we need some sort of assessment of competence or recertification. And the tool is still not very well defined, but we obviously need a valid, reliable, and feasible tool. And up to now, usually it's just self-assessment, but we all know that there is a poor association with the self-assessment, regardless of experience and level of competence and knowledge and the position uh, within the, the, the profession with external assessment. So peer observation and peer assessment program in some countries like Canada has been introduced, uh, 360 degree assessment, which is very good in terms of uh, communicated with all uh, people that uh, a professional is communicating with. And because of that, it's uh, uh, possible to assess not only te uh, technical, but also non-technical skills. And also lately, very often simulators have been uh, uh, recommended uh, because now in anesthesia, we have experience in training with simulators. So it could be assessment of both non-technical and technical skills, but also feedback of what should be improved and to, uh, to lead to some proposed intervention. However, there is a lack of experience with senior medical staff. So it's usually just uh, up to now used for uh, training. And uh, um, let's see what is happening. Uh, it, this is not just anesthesiologist problem. It's a problem overall to a medical profession. So uh, with surgeons, they raised, uh, our fellow surgeons have raised the question of um, uh, competency and outcome with age. And so they recently, uh, American College of Surgery has uh, uh, published this statement uh, saying that uh, well-being uh, and uh, monitoring of outcomes uh, should be a uh, priority with practicing surgeons. And also they raise the question of no mandatory retirement and whole of career competency testing, meaning avoiding any kind of dis uh, discrimination. So not just testing older people, but those testing all professionals over the time. And the problem is that there is no reliable screening tool. And there are also, if some concerns are raised regarding particularly cognitive function that uh, like neurocognitive assessment or a peer uh, review or 360 degrees of the testing should be performed. And also that does not mean uh, immediate retirement, but more like long uh, term career transformation in terms of uh, uh, practicing in some different tasks and not just uh, uh, 
operating theaters. And just as well, here we see also for senior uh, some uh, uh, structure pre-retirement winding down, meaning that let's say probably it is suggested that uh, if we are over 60, probably there should be no on-call duties from 65 to 69. Probably we should avoid uh, these high intense uh, cases with uh, 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 with a lot of stress and uh, need for uh, quick decision making. And over 70, probably leaving the OR and moving to some other tasks and uh, uh, within the profession should be advisable. Meanwhile, in Serbia, just to touch a, a policy in my country, is that anesthesiologists are treated like everybody else, same as clerks and bank uh, working people, people working in factories like everybody else. So if uh, diseased uh, during the life uh, um, uh, day, if they are uh, assessed for, if they are assessed that unfit for job, they could go for premature ret retirement or part-time job. And mandatory retirement from public service is there at 65 years for both men and women. And women may retire a little bit earlier and university professors may stay two more academic years. Uh, also, there is no dedicated pol policy if uh, retired uh, uh, practitioners decide to work on the co under contract in the private practice. So instead of summary, because there is really not much that we can uh, uh, firmly say that is recommended nowadays, we should probably think of some questions, answers to some questions. For example, should anesthesiologists be retired mandatory, like pilots, for example? Or what age should be appropriate to scale diet practice? Or should simulation or direct ob observation be involved in recertification? And uh, should the assessment or competence be mandatory as well? And do we actually know what different countries are doing and uh, if that is successful or not? And also why are data and research on this topic missing? Why is nobody actually, not nobody, but like few people are actually dealing with this obviously burning problem uh, within uh, our profession? So uh, just at the end, we will just uh, have two poll uh, questions. And uh, so please uh, um, just uh, uh, feel free to vote and uh, the results we will discuss at the end. And I will just go back. We go back to Hazel, and she will proceed with the with the following speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Neskovic, for such an insightful uh, presentation and talk, uh, getting us thinking about what questions we need to be asking. Again, it's a pleasure for me to invite our second speaker, who is Dr. Mauro Pereira de Azevedo. Dr. Azevedo serves as a staff. Uh, and head of the Medical Residency Program of Anesthesiology at Marcelio Diaz Navy Hospital in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Dr. Azevedo has also been elected as a member of the Quality and Safety Committee of the Brazilian Society of Anesthesiology. Dr. Azevedo will be speaking to us today about inequalities in retirement, um, and he will be looking at it from the basis of Brazil, a huge country with many faces. Dr. Azevedo, thank you very much for taking time to speak with us today and over to you for your talk. First of all, uh, I'm thank you, thankful for the WFSCA for the this webinar with a so important uh, subject. Uh, I'm uh, now I'm uh, with 35 years of practicing anesthesiology. I graduated in 1988. And uh, I don't want to retire by now. I want to retire very early. But it's very important to discuss our retirement. As Dr. Jonathan Katz said in this uh, editorial, he was a former uh, member of the Committee on Occupational Health from ASA. 
He said that the decision to go from active duty to the retirement is very tough. Uh, and it's a decision that no one wants to take. Uh, in Brazil, we are a big country, the fifth largest in the world, with a population of 212 million people. And we are the eighth economy in the world with a GDP of $2.1 trillion. But a GDP per capita very low. And we have in Brazil some areas very rich, like São Paulo, Distrito Federal, Rio de Janeiro, and areas very poor, like Maranhão, Piauí, and Paraíba. So this will uh, reflect in the assistance of our health care. But our health care, in spite of this, is very well constructed because we have in Brazil the SUS, Sistema Único de Saúde, in English, Unified Health System, which all levels, in which all levels of government uh, participate of with some uh, budgets, collect from the tax paid by the, the people, and everyone in Brazil have the right to be assisted by the United Unified Health System with no charge. It's for free for everybody, and it's for free for you if you come to Brazil to visit us. Science uh, uh, consultation with a primary care medical until a heart transplantation if you need. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is very uh, 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 it's very good. And it has some principles that are very good too. It's universal for all citizens. It's integral from primary care to advanced care. And it has equity. It's made more investment where the needs are greater. So we have uh, he, a real democratic healthcare system, public healthcare system. But for those who have money or don't want to use the public system because it's not perfect, we have the supplementary system where we expend our money directly or through a supplementary health system for healthcare insurance. And the budget, of our healthcare system is about 9% of our GDP. Uh, Brazil is the biggest country in Latin America. And we have about 25,000 uh, doctors practicing anesthesia in Brazil. We don't have nurses, anesthesiologists. We don't have another uh, uh, professional healthcare uh, doing anesthesia in Brazil, just doctors. And uh, we have a density of uh, uh, about 12 uh, anesthesia providers per 100,000 uh, inhabitants, which make us, made us uh, uh, in a regular position in the world. But if you see in this graphic on the right, uh, you can see that we have very empty areas in Brazil without any anesthesiologists. So we have a very good density in an area uh, alongside the coastline and not in the interior of Brazil. So we need to interiorize go the doctors and the anesthesiologists. Uh, our society is the third in the world with about 12,000 members. And if you can, in, uh, most of them men, 37% are women. And if you see in this uh, graph, uh, this table here, most of them are young. We have 18% older anesthesiologists. This is good and this is bad. Bad because Two young people represents a huge formation of anesthesiology in Brazil. We have too many medical schools in Brazil. So the, 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 the age of Brazilian doctors is very young. 
like you can see in this uh, atary age pyramid here in the left. Uh, the median age of doctors in Brazil is below 55 years old. We have just 28% of our doctors above uh, over 25 years old, uh, uh, below the median, the average, which is 33 years old. Like you can see here, uh, in Italy, the median uh, average age is 55 years. Uh, in Japan, 39 years. So we have a very young population of anesthesiologists. And anesthesia, uh, in, uh, on the contrary of Dr. Uh, Niskovic said, is very desired in Brazil. It's the 50 more specialty required, desired in Brazil. 6.3% of our doctors seek to a formation in anesthesiology. And the Brazilian society qualifies about 1,000 new specialists per year to all Brazil. But again, they want to uh, locate their job uh, near the coast and not in the countryside. Uh, co in continuation, we have about 3,000 specialists and uh, over five point, uh, 55 years, 37% of anesthesiologists are over 55 years and the average age of our anesthesiologists is about 50, 50 years. If we go to the study, the economic of SUS, uh, the unified health system, it, like everywhere in the world, suffers with a low budget. And it will be reflecting the average monthly income of doctors. Doctors uh, who work just for SUS earn less than $3,000 a year uh, monthly if he just work for Swiss. But to make more money, they want to, they need to go to the private practice. But instead in private practice, if you see the average income by tax refunds, you see that the amount is lowering very highly. In 12, uh, 2012, the median, the average uh, income was 16 thousand dollars and now it's about fifty five point five thousand uh, dollars a big reduction in our income mainly from private practice private practice and as old as we get during our, our practice uh, the average income reduces and this will be reflected in our retirement because we need to save money during our life to have a health retirement and if we do if we earn less money during our life especially in when we are old we don't have savings to go to to to, to our home so what, what we see here like everywhere in the world we are seeing doctors with advanced age continuing working in the surgical units, because not they want, but because they need to do it. And to make money, we have to work in a lot of workplaces and a lot of hours weekly and in public practice and in private practice. You see in this graph on the right that most doctors work in both uh, mechanisms, public and private, to keep her in, uh, financial healthfully. So at some point we have to think about retirement. And to think about retirement, we have to think what will do us retire from our job? Chronological age or biological age? It's possible to make a stand mark to define when we must retire. I may be 50 year old with excellent health and I may have a 50 year old with a bad health condition. So to retire, we have to figure out a lot of things. 
But first of all, financial situation, not just chronological or biological age. We have to face our cognitive skills, our physical, physical and health status, the professional satisfaction, the organization of your uh, location of work, and if you are fatigated or uh, with a burnout. Né? It's not about money. It's also our identity. You work through 40 years, 50 years of your life in the same uh, situation, and suddenly you stop working. Someone can lose his, her identity. So did you make a retirement plan? When you started your retirement plan, it's very important here in Brazil and elsewhere because public pension is reducing. The government don't have in no, no country in the world, as long as I know, uh, money to pay pensions to younger people. So we have to make a retirement plan since we start our career, our career. I think that the retirement plan is start together with our career because at some point of our life, we will have to stop working. Uh, this uh, research made by uh, International Monetary Fund here in the left shows that in the blue line, that uh, in the blue line, we have the people, aged people in between 25 and 59 years who earn much money to pay the tax and the, the government don't make money, they collect the tax that will return to the people by the social, social security. If we have a population too young or too old, we will have less people pay, <laughs> we will have less people, fewer people paying for more people as you can see in the graph in the right, uh, that shows that uh, through the years, the number of contributors is going down related to the beneficiaries, or, or, uh, which means less, fewer people are paying for more people. And the budget don't support this. And the government, what they do, they extend the retirement and reduces the payment of the pension. Uh, in, in the left, you can see uh, the source of support for the elderly. And you see in Europe, uh, a welfare state, uh, uh, where we have the welfare state, most of the incomes is from public transfers. But in Asia and the United States, People need the savings to keep a healthy uh, retirement. And in the right, you see that the employer contribution rate in Brazil, this graph from Brazil, is increasing every year. Every year, our tax are going up to pay the social security, which is the largest expense of of our government. And if life expectancy is going up and the birth rate is decreasing, we will fall in that graphic that shows, that uh, show uh, less people paying for more people to live. So the retirement in Brazil is very tough. We have no objective rules. We will work until we want or until we need to work. And the need is basically financial. There are no tests to evaluate professional abilities anytime. We see some colleagues, we've reduced the professional ability, but still in the surgical unit. And it's very sad to see that because we know that's bad for him, it's bad for the patient, it's bad for the system. But some until we approach him and say, 
Mauro, you cannot keep working. It's very, very, very hard. So, to retire, especially from private practice, it's a matter of personal decision or peer influence, or your family uh, ask you to stop working. We have three modalities in Brazil from social security. The general social security regime, that is for all works, the own social security regimes, that is for public servers, and anyone can uh, hire a complementary regime, like a pension fund, to complement the incomes from social security. And the retire being in the retirement is going hard, hard at a year. We can retire by age, 65 for men or six for women, by length of service, 30 years, 35 years of contributions for men or third year for women. By special conditions, if you, you work in a ha uh, hard profession or by disability of any age, at any age. But again, the maximum value, the maximum amount that you we earn from the social security is about one thousand one point five thousand dollars is a very low budget the medium amount is about three three hundred and thirty dollars monthly here in brazil don't we don't use uh, the annual budget we use month budget income but month income it's very low 21 to earn uh, $1.5,000. So we have to hire a complementary regime similar to funding pensions. Private, we pay every year, every month to make a huge saving that we will withdraw at the end of our professional life. But it's a cost to us. It's one another cost to us to our lives. If you uh, observe in this uh, research uh, from Brazilian investor, instead of the complementary pension, the largest source of income in retirement keeps being the public pension. Only a few people have another form, uh, another source of income, like uh, private pension, property rental, investments. Even in the higher social classes, even the higher social classes, the largest source of income is the public pension. So we are very dependent on the government to retire. And if the gov government pays a low uh, salary to us, we just have one option, keep working, uh, stressing the system, stressing even us until uh, we have to stop working. So how to live after retirement? We have to figure out that the public pension is low. We have to keep working if possible. And like Dr. Neskovic said, change to ed education or administrative or other activities with low level of stress, or we have to develop new abilities, reskill ourselves to another kind of job. We have to use complementary pension and reduce our no uh, essential spending. At the end, I present here my personal retirement plan. I will leave from public pension, like everywhere, my private pension, my investment, my rentals, and I want to work less, save more, because my daughters are grown, enjoy life, and die too late. It's a very important retirement plan. Die late. Because we have to work longer to live well. So I think I will go straight from the hospital to the graveyard. And then we will see what happens. So uh, I'm... I uh, I apologize for the time, and I'm very thankful to say what is the figure in Brazil. Uh, thank you to all.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azevedo, for that great uh, presentation and great talk and, you know, uh, quite sobering, um, making us think around uh, where we're going and, um, uh, and also where some of us are at now. And um, uh, this brings us uh, into our last speaker, and it is my great uh, uh, pleasure to introduce our last speaker, who is Professor Rebecca Jacob. Uh, Professor Jacob is a distinguished anesthesiologist with extensive experience in both clinical and uh, medical education. Uh, Dr. Jake, Professor Jacob has served in many clinical as well as non-clinical leadership uh, positions and is currently, one of them which is currently that she holds, she sits on the Medical Advisory Council for Smile Tree in India. Professor Jacob uh, is also uh, ex extensively published and has published um, in about, uh, in several journals with 86 papers uh, that have been reviewed. Professor Jacob um, will be talking to us today about accepting the inevitable and she'll be giving us uh, the perspective of an aging anesthesiologist. Professor Jacob, thank you very much for speaking with us today and uh, over to you. I am Professor Rebecca Jacob. Today I'd speak about my journey through anesthesia to retirement accepting the inevitable. It was in 1973 that I joined the Department of Anesthesia at the Christian Medical College, Velo, a temple town in southern India. In the early years, I spent time learning the ropes, studying and getting my diploma and degree in anesthesiology. I got married and started a family. I never considered retirement or its implications during those days. What I learned was how to intubate using red rubber tubes, metal connectors, hypodermic needles, glass syringes, and um, metal three-way taps were the order of the day. We even used EMOs to give anesthesia. All equipment was sterilized in these sterilizers. The Boyle's machine was a mainstay, we used ether or halothane in Goldman vaporizers. We hand ventilated our patients and used the overhead lights to keep our babies warm. Monitoring was a hand on the pulse, blood pressure using a stethoscope and Sligbo manometer, eyes on the operating field and temperature with a thermometer. Blood always came in glass bottles. The tubing was always rubber and IV fluids were given either with a micro drip, which was 30 drops per ml, or a regular drip, which was 15 drops per ml. We spent a lot of time counting drops to make sure that we were giving the right volume. But a lot has changed. We have PAC clinics, pre-meds, um, parental presence at induction, which was a no-no in the early years. We have recovery areas, protocols and guidelines. Post-operative pain management is here to stay. I felt I could navigate these and keep up with changes effortlessly. Now we have the anesthesia workstations. We have multi-channel monitors, pulse oximeters, wherever it goes. And yes, I could handle these. I could even handle giving a lot of fluid in various lines and I learned how to use the LMA, the supraglottic airway devices which changed our life and attitude to anesthesia. We stopped having to worry about doing blind nasal intubation and we had the fiber optic scopes to navigate the airway. But I had a niggling doubt. Will I be able to cope with newer technology such as computers, ultrasonography, robotics, etc., etc.? This was unvoiced, but still very much there in the back of my mind. While I doubted this and worried about it, I decided to continue teaching anesthesia both to my students and elsewhere 
in other Indian universities in Malaysia, Cambodia. I became professor of the University Medical College. I was examiner in many Indian universities and abroad. I even managed a study leave in Adelaide, South Australia to hone my skills in pediatric anesthesia. I took on various commitments. I was the scientific chairperson of the 4th Saga Congress in 1999, organized the 5th ASPA Congress in 2006. I went to various countries, judged free papers, poster presentations, I was guest lecturer elsewhere. I also helped in various mission hospitals, such as in the Padar Mission Hospital, where we went to separate conjoint twins. I trained first responders of landmine injuries in Cambodia, along with the Trauma Care Foundation, a Norwegian group. I was involved with the WFSA since 1996, starting with the Primary Trauma Care Foundation, I was a trainer in Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. I served on the Committee of Safety and Quality and chaired the Pediatric Committee in 2008 to 2012. I started the WFSA Pediatric Anesthesia Training Fellowship in Velo, which was the second in India, uh, um, second in the world after Chile. Trained a lot of youngsters from Asian countries such as Bhutan, the Maldives, Nepal, Bangladesh. I was also involved with the Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesia and was instrumental in setting up the Pediatric Perioperative Life Support and trained the trainers' workshops across Asia along with Dr. Agnes Ng. Mm. The next project we plan is the ASPA Smile Train Safe Pediatric Anesthesia Projects workshops across India, Indonesia, Philippines and on to the rest of Asia. Other responsibilities I had was being president of the Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesia, the Research Society of Anesthesia and Clinical Pharmacology, the Indian Association of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Anesthetists, and of course the ASPA. I was also a member of the Indian Medical Advisory Councils since 2008 of Smile Train India. I have quite a few uh, publications. Um, I have a textbook on pediatric anesthesia. I was at various times member of the editorial board of various journals. I also wrote chapters in other people's textbooks. As I grew along, I developed my love for pediatric anesthesia, which taught me patience. And along with joy and laughter, there were also tears of frustration. But at the end of the day, a deep satisfaction. For decades, my career had kept me busy, provided me with fulfillment, a professional identity, a status in the academic and social community, as well as providing a continuing intellectual challenge. Retirement? Did I have to consider it? When should I consider it? When should I retire? When my colleagues or I feel I have neurocognitive dysfunction? When I have visual problems or hearing loss? When I have enough money stashed away for a comfortable retirement? When should I retire? Well, that wasn't a worry for me because the university and medical college had mandated retirement at 60 years of age. 60 years of age. I retired in 2008 and I opted to move to Bangalore to look after my elderly parents. My father was, had age-related problems and cancer. My mother had dementia. Finances were not too much of a problem as my institution gave me a small pension as well as complete health benefits. Transitioning to this new life was not going to be easy. How could I adjust to the social and psychological challenge and not feel deprived of my true identity as a senior anesthesiologist? I still needed to feel valued and socially connected. The year, 60 years is too young. My value should not be dismissed as I still had so much more to give. 
would I find time hanging heavily on my hands? I kept up with academics, teaching and writing. And this meant that I was an active participant in my specialty. I brought out the fourth edition of the te my textbook on pediatric anesthesia. I continued mentoring and working with organizations like ASPA, Smile Train, and also managed to fit in some clinical work in a small trust hospital near my house. I knew that the successful practice of anesthesiology requires a high degree of knowledge and skill as well as mental and physical stamina. But at the age of 70, would I be able to handle the stress of anesthetizing little children in a place where I didn't have very much clinical backing? Well, after committing myself to work and family, I decided that I was not Atlas and did not need to carry everyone's burdens on my shoulders. I stopped doing clinical work. I decided to love myself and devote more time to things that made me happy. I looked forward to this phase of my life with confidence and excitement. Why? Because I looked to what made me happy. All the non-clinical interests I had developed during my career – painting, cooking, sewing, traveling, and gardening – which gives me a lot of happiness. I kept up with social networking and kept in touch with old friends, my schoolmates, my college mates, my students, and my family. My husband and I live in Bangalore. We have two sons. The older one is an orthopedic surgeon in Melbourne where he lives with his family. The younger one, a corporate lawyer in London and where he lives with his family. I have two very nice daughters-in-law and four wonderful grandchildren. A few things I have learned along the way. I have learned not to correct people even when I know they are wrong, because the onus of making everyone perfect is not on me. Peace is more precious than perfection. Now I give compliments freely. Compliments are mood enhancers, especially for me. Never turn it down. Just say thank you. I have learned not to bother about a crease or a spot on my dress because my personality speaks louder than appearances. I walk away from people who do not value me. They may not know my worth, but I do. I must let past conflicts go. I remain cool when someone plays dirty to outrun me in the rat race. I am not a rat, nor am I in any race. I am learning not to be embarrassed by my emotions. It's my emotions that make me human. I have lived each day as if it is my last. After all, it might be. I am doing what makes me happy. I am responsible for my happiness and I owe it to myself as I still matter. Happiness is a choice. You can be happy at any time. Just choose to be. Thank you very much, Professor Jacob, for that very insightful movie about your experience. All right, so I'll now move on to the question and answer session of our panel. Um, I, I would like to address my first question to Professor Neskovic, which is the um, very interesting idea that you raised around place of simulation um, versus assessment. We've received quite a lot of questions in the chat about the um, aspects of assessment. You mentioned um, neurocognitive assessment, the fact that there can be flaws in the processes, what would be the correct age to start such assessment. So simulation was another um, aspect of that that you raised. And I'm curious about the use of simulation for 
um, a summative rather than just formative um, experiences for anaesthetists? Well, thank you very much for the for the question raised. Uh, the point is that uh, its uh, simulation is appearing in um, uh, literature, although I have to say there is no much data in literature on uh, strategies or assessing competencies in, uh, uh, let's say, more experienced anesthesiologists. And uh, uh, the, pro the problem um, uh, is uh, uh, whether it is, first of all, feasible to uh, uh, put all the experienced and more senior anesthetists into, uh, into simulation uh, center. Uh, and uh, uh, the point is that there is no much experience and uh, it is a part of uh, a MOCA uh, recertification program in the United States, not only for anesthetists, but for doctors, but it's still on voluntary basis. And uh, it is a sort of, uh, um, let's say, common knowledge that the more senior doctors are reluctant to be uh, assessed within the simulation. And it is possible the simulation can be a summative uh, um, examination at the end, uh, but uh, I would uh, prefer to use it in uh, this process of uh, aging as a formative, uh, long, uh, lifelong career assessment so that we can all see our flaws and then in those terms we can uh, put some intervention and improve our practice and uh, our continuous medical education during the uh, lifetime span. Uh, so um, I am not sure that we are close to a moment that simulation will be used regularly. Uh, still within the training, it is not present in many countries yet. So uh, making it like obligatory part or one of the, uh, let's say, parts of a recertification or reassessment of senior anesthesiologists is still, I think, far uh, from uh, today. Thank you, uh, Professor Laskowish. Um, I'm going to put a question to Professor Jacob. Uh, there's been talk of uh, simulation and uh, cognitive testing, um, and um, uh, but these are not feasible in low middle income countries and lower income countries. But something that is feasible is the support that is offered by the junior colleagues or by the department. Um, could you comment on that? How, how can that be done? Um, it's, it's a little difficult in, a, in countries that are as big and as varied, providing um, anesthesia in such varied situations. We can't mandate anything. It is up to the aging anesthetists as we grow more senior to encourage the youngsters so it the, is the relationship we build up with our younger colleagues, which will we can't mandate anything to deal with the youngsters. And um, in the medical colleges and academic areas, they will mandate date or time or say at the age of 60, you don't do on call and the youngsters will support you because they will just perhaps ring you up at home, but you don't come in on call. But uh, when you do private practice, very often you're alone. You are in a situation where you don't have the support services, or you may be working alone in, a, in another small institution, which become, makes it more difficult. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Yes, I'd like to ask you, um, Dr. Atzevedo, about the conversations that happen at the point that someone should leave their career and how that is conducted with so much um, personal uh, burden to continue, as you've outlined in Brazil, for the reasons you've outlined, um, how the conversation, we had a lot of questions on the chat about who should be deciding, who should be having the conversation, the relationship between an individual and their practice. And I'm curious to hear how those conversations happen 
in your country if there isn't a hard time to finish, a hard age to finish, how that would be managed for the individual? And you are muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Thank you. It's, uh, it's very... It's very uh, when we, you have to talk to anyone about any kind of uh, incapacity, disability. Uh, it's not easy, like when when you have to talk to someone about the uh, substance abuse. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, what we see here is uh, someone. Uh, with physical incapacity, disability, mental disability, working with someone some younger than him. It's very common here. Uh, someone asked who uh, helped us in the anesthesia. We don't have assistance here. So we work alone or with another colleague or with a fellow or with a resident. And when you get old, you turn your job to divide the job with another people. And this youngest colleague uh, prolongs our life, our, our life in the work, because we uh, now we are a senior anesthesiologist just supervising a younger who is really making the, 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 the job. Yeah? We serve as a consultant. But sometimes we have to tell these people, you cannot work anymore. You have to go home. And this is very sad. And we don't have an, ex, an structure to do this. Uh, it's very personal, it's very perso uh, personal. Uh, emotional, uh, without uh, assistance of a uh, skilled professional like a psychologist, a uh, psychiatric or social assistance. And we have to tell the people, the, the, the person, you have to go home. And when he goes home, the money, which is the primary motivator, to keep working, the money will go out and we will create a social problem to the doctor and to his family. Can but, I ask you a question? How, how would you like to be told when it is your time that it is your time to go? How would you like to be told? How would you like how to How do I like to be told? How would you? In the uh, uh, how would you I, like I will to say you... Told? Uh, uh, first of all, my family. I have uh, three superb women in my home that will not allow me to work if I can't. They will say to me to stay home. And if not possible, I want to have a personal judgment that I'm not doing the best for the patient. I, I think that we have to have a, 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 a stream personal judgment that we are not doing the best for the patient. And if we are not doing the best, we can't keep doing it. We have to do another things. So- uh, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much for that insight now. And I will hand over to Fazia. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, just taking this forward, uh, Dr. Naskovic, uh, there was there were a couple of questions that were sent to us, uh, which were asking, how should one discuss competencies with aging colleagues and how to approach them in a departmental uh, scene? Well, I I am I I can just uh, give my um, personal advice, and I think that we all need some communication uh, skills that are full of respect and uh, empathy. 
uh, but uh, one of the uh, ways to approach and thinking about the timing to leave uh, would be to get the, the feedback from your uh, peers or trusted colleagues that can uh, just uh, in a gentle way uh, give you, uh, let's say, uh, um, in, uh, opinion or feedback that you could probably uh, reconsider what you are doing during the every day. So in those terms, this emotional, personal, uh, friendship, uh, uh, let's say, uh, communication could uh, make it easier not to leave it to some uh, independent body that really don't know anything about you and just tell you, well, it's time off you go, which is happening, actually. And some of the um, uh, practitioners in UK uh, in those uh, document or trusted uh, retained and uh, that I have just shown uh, to my presentation really objected on that, that nobody really, uh, that they decided to leave because the communication was not right. Uh, so um, uh, obviously we don't have uh, answers, we just have questions. And I think that's the good place to start, to start thinking about uh, the topic and the problems. Over to you, Susan. Yes, well, I'd just like to um, thank all of our panelists again. Um, I think that um, we're coming to the conclusion of the webinar, and um, it's been very interesting to consider these questions. Um, please watch out. There's going to be more work done to um, try and find some answers and some solutions that are relevant to this. We are all by definition aging one day at a time, um, but we are talking really, I guess, about career transitions and the sort of strategies that we can use to anticipate in a way that will be good for our well-being, good for our career end um, and our life after, as we've eloquently heard from Professor Jacob. So thank you all for taking the time. And um, I'll just actually briefly go back to you, um, Professor Neskovic, to uh, present on the results of the poll, and then we will conclude the webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, the results of uh, the polls, as, as we see, so majority think that there should not be a mandatory uh, retirement or predefined uh, age for uh, anaesthetists. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, it seems that the uh, uh, majority thinks that there should be some kind of recertification and uh, uh, including uh, simulation. Um, well, I uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, taking part in the poll in polls, uh, and uh, I um, uh, with the, all these uh, presentations, I think that we should keep in mind uh, that aging anesthesiologists uh, should not probably be treated as a group, but as a group of individuals. And uh, the most challenging will be to address everybody uh, individually and in those terms, uh, uh, defining and uh, deciding uh, where is the time to retire or change uh, uh, or scale down the professional activities. So I think this is a challenge of the future years and decades. And uh, it would be very nice that we all take part in this and uh, uh, give our contribution to this obviously very intriguing topic according to the interests that uh, everybody of all participants have shown. Thank you very much. Okay, um, now I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the three speakers for their excellent presentations and our subcommittee who helped develop us, uh, help us develop this program and I would like to take their names. They are Professor uh, Naskovic from Serbia, Professor Luis Antonio Diego from Brazil, and Dr. Hazel Memfrancha from Zambia. And our administrative help from uh, WFSA, Ms. Rosa Geriga Mora. I would also like to thank all of you who have taken time from the busy schedules uh, to attend this webinar. And we will be sharing the presentations on our WFSA uh, YouTube channel. Uh, kindly stay with, with us for another minute so that we can share the information of our next World Congress 
which will be held in Marrakesh in 2026. Thank you.